Hi, this is Pastor Jones from the Wesley Amazon Church. Have you ever gone somewhere and when you got there, you felt like you had been set up? You received an invitation. It seemed innocent. It seemed like it was going to be a time of fellowship and joy. But when you got there, you realized there was an ulterior motive at hand. Well, today we have a message that deals with that. Let's go into the message. Giving honor to God our Father and for all of the great work that he's doing in our lives and how he continues to bless us day by day and minute by minute. I uh, just give praise and glory and honor unto him, and to Bishop Darrell B. Starnes Sr. and to his lovely wife, Sister Camille Starnes, and That's amen, nice. to Reverend Wanda Cutberson and to all of the officers and family and friends of the Wesley Amy Zion Church and the St. Mark ba Missionary Baptist Church. We greet you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus who is the Christ? Amen. Our scripture text that was read earlier uh, out of the book of Nehemiah, the sixth chapter, the sixth chapter of Nehemiah. I want to lift up verses two through nine out of that chapter. That's Nehemiah chapter six, verses two through nine. It reads, So send ballad, and Geshem sent a message asking me to meet them at one of the villages in the plain of Ono. But I realized they were plotting to harm me. So I replied by sending this message to them. I am engaged in a great work, so I can't come. Why should I stop working to come and meet with you? Four times they sent the same message. And each time I gave them the same, the same reply. The fifth time, Sambalat's servant came with an open letter in his hand. And this is what it said. There's a rumor among the surrounding nations, and Geshem tells me it is true, that you and the Jews are planning to rebel, and that is why you are building the wall. According to his reports, you plan to be their king. He also reports that you have appointed prophets in Jerusalem to proclaim about you. Look, there is a king in Judah. You can be very sure that this report will get back to the king. So I suggest that you come and talk it over with me. I replied, there is no truth in any part of your story you are making up the whole thing. They were just trying to intimidate us, imagining that they could discourage us and stop the work. So I continued to work with even greater determination. Amen. I worked with greater determination. Amen. I want to share today from the subject of it's a setup. It's a setup. Let us pray. Gracious Father, we come now into your point of your service, O oh God, where we proclaim your word. We ask now, God, that you would come in all of your glory, Father, and fill me afresh, God. Use me for your will and for your glory. Have your way, Lord. Have your way. And I pray, Father, that as you pour into me, that you would allow me to pour out into the power and inspiration of your Holy Spirit, and that you would use me now, God, for the edification and the upbuilding of your people, and the edification and the upbuilding of your kingdom. Father, we thank you and we bless you, but we ask now, God, as well, that you would open our ears and help us to listen. Open our eyes, for we want to see Jesus. Then open our hearts that we might receive him. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the blessed Holy Ghost. Amen. It's a setup. At times in our life, we may receive an invitation, um, invitation to come to some type of event, maybe a wedding invitation, a dinner party invitation, or birthday invitation, or maybe we just get some invitation inviting us to some social event that someone is holding. But when we talk about getting an invitation, there are different types of invitation. There's a formal and informal. 
uh, there's a printed, there's written. But these invitations are generally given in an effort to get us to come and be a part of some type of activity or some event. So those people will send an invitation. They are inviting us to come and join them. They're inviting us to come and be a part of what they are doing. When we look at the text in front of us today, we find that we see an invitation is being extended. An invitation is being extended from Sam Ballad and Tobiah, and, and they are extending an invitation to Nehemiah. Now, as we have been making our way through the book of Nehemiah, we have saw up to this point that Nehemiah is doing a fantastic job. He's doing a great work of rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. And we saw that he had come to a point where he had put the walls halfway up and Sanballat and Tobiah came at that point also with an invitation. But now we see that the work continued because Nehemiah did not go on that initial invite. And we see that the enemy does not give up. The enemy does not quit. And they continue to come at Nehemiah with one invitation after another. And now we come to the sixth chapter where we find that Nehemiah is being sent yet another invitation. And this invitation comes from, again, Sanballat, Tobiah. And they are sending an invitation to say, come and meet with us. We have to be careful about the invitations that we accept. And when I look at the text, I see that it is showing me that Sometimes when people send us invitations, those invitations sometimes aren't what they seem to be. Yeah, I know when we get invited to weddings, we, we anticipate it being a glorious time and we anticipate it being a time of, of joy and, and fellowship. But sometimes we have to be careful. Sometimes people can get messy. Sometimes people can, can get in their feelings and, and you might receive an invitation, but that invitation is sent in order to cause a problem. Now, how many times have people invited someone to a wedding knowing that the person that they've invited used to have a relationship with one of the people within the marriage ceremony? Yet, but they know that they've invited this person because it would cause an issue. It would cause a problem with the couple that's about to get married. Yeah, we got to be careful about these invitations. Or, or maybe you know somebody that invited someone to a party, but they knew that there was somebody else at that party that, that they had an issue with. And they invited them to the party, nonetheless knowing that a problem was going to jump off. Yes, you got to be careful about the invitations in which we receive. Because sometimes the invitation can simply be a setup. That's right, the invitation can be a setup, and you may find yourself being a victim rather than coming to a place where you're experiencing the joy and the fellowship of the party or of the celebration. We got to be careful again about the invitations that we receive because sometimes the invitations are a setup. And when we look at our text today, we're going to discover that when we're talking about a setup, yes, Nehemiah is trying to be, or they're trying to set Nehemiah up in the text. And a setup is a scheme that's intended to deceive someone. And it's done within an effort that caused hurt or damage. Yes, when we think about the, the, the setup that's coming, when we think about the setup that's being shown to us in the text. And, and, and even as we were talking this morning in Sunday school and, and how it came up about uh, Amnon and, and how it came up about Absalom. How Amnon basically lured his, his stepsister into the house and under the pretenses that he was sick. And how he really wanted to lie with her. He set her up. And as he set her up, he set her up to be raped. And he set her up that he might cause harm in her life. He, he came under the disguise that he was sick. And the, the thing is, he told his cousin that he loved her so much. That he just wanted her. He loved her so much. But after he got what he wanted... He kicked her out of the house. That's some love for you right there. And then Absalom, when he found out what happened to his sister Tamar, and he, he decided that he was going to do something about it because his father David didn't do anything about it. His father David didn't take any action with the son Amnon. So Absalom asked David, he said, can I invite all of my brothers and you out to a dinner 
But the father said, no, I, I, I can't come. I, I won't be able to make it. And he said, well, make sure that Amnon will be there. He invited Amnon to the dinner. It was a setup. And in the process of him getting all of his brothers there to the dinner, Absalom killed Amnon. See, we have to be careful because there are times when the invite is simply a setup. We got to be careful that the invite that have we have received, the invite that may have come in the mail, and it may have looked so pretty. It, it may have had all of the, the latest characteristics of, of an invite, and it, and it may have cost them a great deal of money to send you that invite. But again, we have to be careful about every invitation that we receive. And when we look at our text, we got to understand this. There are times when we can find ourselves being the victims of a setup. We must be careful of the invitations that ultimately take us away from the work of God. Yes, there are some times that we receive invitations, but those invitations are geared toward taking us away from the work that God has us engaging in. So that's why we must be careful about the invitations that we receive and that we accept. When we look at our text, we're going to discover some things about the invitation that was sent and extended to Nehemiah. And we're going to look at some things that we need to take into consideration and understanding as we consider the, tech, the invitation that Nehemiah received. And one thing we need to understand is this. Carefully consider the invitation. Yes, you got to carefully consider the invitation in which you receive. Think about this for a moment. When we look at the beginning of Nehemiah chapter 6, we see that it was Sanballat, Tobiah, and Geshem that have sent this invitation to Nehemiah. One of the first things that we've got to understand is that we've got to carefully consider the invitation that we have been sent. We have to start by asking, who's behind the invite? Who is behind the invitation that we have received? Who is it that's inviting us to the activity? Who's inviting us to the event? And when we began to start there, that should help a lot of us out because sometimes the person that makes the invite will determine whether or not we attend the function, whether or not we go to the event. But it just understand this as well. This is not just talking about physical and fleshly things. There are also some times when we receive what we call spiritual invites. Yeah, those invites are spiritual in nature. And when we think about those spiritual invites, they're inviting us to come and engage in a certain activity, to come and engage in a certain thing or function. And if we're not careful, we'll find ourselves engaging in something that God doesn't want us to be a part of because we did not carefully consider who sent the invite. We've got to make sure that we understand who sent the invite. We start with who the invite has come from, and that helps us to begin to whether or not we even consider accepting the invite or not. And then what are they inviting you to? What are they inviting you to? What is the invite for? Is the invite in, uh, inviting you to an activity that is wholesome and holy? Is it inviting you to an activity that God would be pleased with? What is the invite for? And I know that there are invitations that we receive to, to come to some uh, function. And, and, and yes, you don't have to indulge in and engage in what everybody else is engaged in. But when we think about the invite, what is the activity of the invite? I remember someone sharing with me one time that they were invited to a party, but they said when they got to the party and they saw the stuff that was happening at the party, they began to wonder why the person extended them the invite in the first place. And the thing that they began to wonder the most was, did the person think that I was the way that the rest of these people were? Again, we got to be careful about who sent the invitation and what are they inviting us to? They may be inviting us some, to something and, and they may not be aware of who we are. They may not be aware of our lifestyle. And yes, sometimes we don't go around with the, just flashing and, and telling everybody that we're a Christian, although it should be evident in your life. But we don't have to run around declaring to everybody that we, oh, I'm a Christian. Oh, I'm a child of the living king. But there should be some evidence in our lives that show who we are. And someone may not know you that well, but they send you an invitation and you accept that invitation and you go to the event. But while you're there, 
understand that you're still a child of the king. While you're there, understand that you still belong to the most high God. While you're there, you understand that you're still an ambassador to the body of Christ. And you carry yourself in that manner. You conduct yourself in a manner that is pleasing to the Lord. But it starts with us carefully considering the invitation. Who sent the invitation? And what are they inviting us to? And the invitation sometimes can be meant to cause separation or harm. Yes, there are times that we may be invited to something, but the invitation has only come to separate us from someone or to separate us from some activity that we're currently engaged in. And that's where we find Nehemiah today. The invitation has come to separate Nehemiah from the people and from the work. Yes, when you look at the text, you'll find that they have invited Nehemiah. And if you go back to the previous chapter, you've seen that they have been coming at Nehemiah time and time again, trying to get him to do one thing, and that's to stop the work. They're trying to get Nehemiah to stop the work that he's engaged in. And Nehemiah understands that he can't stop the work. He understands that he's there for a reason and a purpose. And that reason is to make sure that the walls of Jerusalem are rebuilt to bring protection back to the city again, to bring safety back to the city again, to restore the city back to its rightful place. Nehemiah has that one goal and objective, and he's determined that he's going to do it. And he's gotten the people involved in the work. He's gotten the people enthusiastic about the work. And the people are moving forward, and they're progressing to the point that the work is almost complete. The walls are built. The doors haven't been hung in place, but the walls are in place. And Nehemiah has encouraged and strengthened the people to the point that the wall is going up. And yes, we even saw last week how Nehemiah faced a little bit of opposition that came from within. But yet Nehemiah was still able to deal with that which rose from within and keep the work moving forward. So Nehemiah understands that this invitation that he's received from Sanballat, Tobiah, and Geshem, this invitation that he received is to separate him from the people, and it's to separate him from the work. But the invitation also has another motive, and it's to do Nehemiah some harm. So when you think about what's going on, the invitation has come to meet us in the plain of, oh no. <laughs> and Nehemiah's response is, oh no, I'm not going. To this meeting. I'm not going to show up. You can send all the invitations you want, but I am not coming. Because Nehemiah says, and he understood that if I go and meet with you, it takes me away from the people. And if I'm not here to, to encourage them, if I'm not here to keep them excited about the work, what's going to happen to the work? We've already seen what happens when, when a little bit of discouragement gets into the camp, how the people can turn on a dime. And Nehemiah understands if you separate me from the people, they won't have that voice of encouragement. They won't have that voice of hope that I've been sharing with them. But it also means that if I come and meet you, I'm going to be disengaged from the work of building the wall. You see, the, the plain of Ono was about 25 miles away from where Nehemiah was. And if Nehemiah stops the work to travel to Ono, it stops the work that they were doing on the wall. It stops the work from coming to the point of completion. And Nehemiah understands this and he said, this invitation cannot be accepted because this invitation is a setup. This invitation is a setup to get me away from the people. This invitation is a setup to get me away from the work. But he also understood that these men don't mean him any good. Yes, Sanballat, Tobiah, and Geshem don't mean Nehemiah any good. They are out to harm Nehemiah. And you would think that they would get the message by now that Nehemiah is on to them, that he understands that they don't mean him any good. But unfortunately, they don't understand. And yet Nehemiah holds to his guns and he says, I cannot come and meet with you. I cannot come and do what you've asked me to do. I'm working on the wall. I'm doing what God has called and asked me to do. And because I'm doing that, I cannot stop the work. And Nehemiah understands that I cannot accept the invitation because he carefully considered the invitation. But not only must we carefully consider the invitation, we also got to understand, is the invite worth the sacrifice? Yes, is the invite worth the sacrifice? As Nehemiah engages in the work and as they send him 
this invitation. And it told us that they sent this invitation four times. They sent the invitation four times. They kept sending it. They kept sending it. And Nehemiah kept refusing. And it says that as they sent this invitation to Nehemiah, and Nehemiah understood what this thing was about. And he said, I can't come. Each time he replied, I'm not coming. And as he engages in the work still, as he continues to do what God has called him to do, as he continues to put his hand to the work, as he continues to show the people by example how important it is for this wall to be completed. Nehemiah refuses to get disengaged from the work that he's engaged in. But the question we have to ask ourselves is this. How do we value the work that we're engaged in? Nehemiah says, I can't come down. I'm doing a great work. I, I can't come down to meet with you because what I'm doing is important. I can't come down and meet with you because what I'm doing is vital to the city and to the people. I'm doing a great work and I can't come down. Nehemiah says, I'm doing something that's important. I'm doing something that pleases God. I'm, I'm doing something that, that I can't disengage from. And, and, and come and meet with you because you're just simply trying to set me up in the first place. You know, it's amazing to me that Nehemiah, how tactful Nehemiah is. He doesn't let on that he knows what they're up to. He just tells them that I can't come down. I'm doing a great work. What I'm doing is important. What I'm doing is vital to the security and the safety of the city. Nehemiah understood that he's engaged in a work that was important and vital to the life of the people. When we are engaged in the ministry, oftentimes the enemy tries to get us to stop the work. The enemy tries to get us to not do what God has us engaged in. It, 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 does the work seem important to you? Does the work seem vital to you? When we think about what we do in the church and what we do as a ministry, is it important to you? Sometimes we say that it is, but our actions show otherwise. The ministry has to become something that is vital, something that is important. Engaging in ministry has to become something that is vital, something that is important. We've got to understand that God has, a, has us involved in a great work, and we can't keep coming off the wall to do something that the enemy wants us to do. We can't keep coming off the wall to engage in sin. We can't keep coming off the wall to engage in our own personal desires and pleasures because it's drawing us away from the work. Yes, there's nothing wrong with us enjoying life, but are we sacrificing the work of the ministry? Are we sacrificing what God wants us to do in order to engage, engage in the things of this world? We got to be careful about engaging in something that is not that vital or that important to life. And we're engaging in it and it's taking us away from the work of the ministry. Yeah, you may have had a great time. Yeah, you may have enjoyed yourself. But did the ministry suffer in the process? Yeah, you didn't show up for church. Did the ministry suffer in the process? You didn't show up for the meeting or, or, or the activity that the church was engaged in. Did the ministry suffer in the process? And I know everybody can't be at everything every single time. But are we missing more than we are engaged? Are we sacrificing the ministry for other things? Nehemiah understood that I can't sacrifice the work of God to come down for the setup. I can't sacrifice the work that God has me doing in order to come down and be drawn away from the people, from the work, and also to put myself in harm's way. Nehemiah understood that accepting the invitation would stop the work. He understood that if I accept this invitation, it will stop the work that is going on. It will stop the activity that we're engaged in. We, again, have to be careful about the invitations that we receive because the invitation may be a setup to stop the work of God in your life. Yeah, your friend may have invited you to come out and, and go out and have a good time with them, but you're in the midst of engaging in some good, uh, wholesome uh, spiritual work and good, wholesome work within the body of Christ. But yet you say, I'm going to put that down to go out and engage in this activity with my friends. I'm going to put that down to go out and have a good time with my friends. Again, it's nothing wrong with having a good time. It's nothing wrong with getting together with friends. But what are we sacrificing 
in order to do so? What are we sacrificing in order to enjoy something in the flesh? And Nehemiah understood that I'm doing a great work and I can't come down. And this, this, others would be affected as well. Don't we know that every time we may be missing from the ministry, it affects the ministry? Don't we understand that every time we don't get involved in the activity of the ministry, that it, it causes the ministry to suffer? Imagine if we had a 50-person choir. Hallelujah. I'm speaking by faith. Imagine we had a 50-person choir and 48 people decided that I'm not coming to church today. 48 decided I'm not coming to worship today. The worship will still go on. The choir can still sing. But it hurts the ministry that could go forth because we are unwilling to turn down the invitation. And, and, and yes, when we think about if everyone was had the heart of Nehemiah and everyone looked at what they were doing and engaging in in the body of Christ as important. Everyone took the ministry serious and everyone wanted to be engaged in upbuilding and the uplifting of the body of Christ. If everyone wanted to pull their part and to pull their weight in the building up of the ministry, if everyone wanted to do that, and if everyone had the heart of Nehemiah, then I'm going to be engaged in the work. I'm not going to turn down the work of God for an invitation to indulge in something that is non-beneficial, but I'm going to engage in the work of God. You may look at me funny. You may talk about me, but I'm going to keep engaging in the work of God. You may be running my name down in the streets, but I'm going to keep engaging in the work of God because what I see is an important work that's happening in the body of Christ. And God has given me the privilege to be a part of that work. And because God has given me the privilege to be a part of that work, I'm going to stay engaged in the work. I'm not going to sacrifice the work of the ministry to engage in something in the world, but I'm going to stay engaged in the ministry. I'm going to keep doing the great work that God has me engaged in because I understand how important and vital it is. And yes, I'm going to understand I'm not going to let anyone else devalue the work that God is doing through me. Yes, sometimes the invitation comes and it encourages us to come to a place of devaluing the work. Yes, sometimes the enemy may show up and say, oh, you do that all the time. You're always engaged in that. Why don't you take a break? That break could become our downfall. That break could become our breaking point. And again, I understand we need time to rest. I understand that we need time to enjoy life, but count the cost. Is it going to be a sacrifice of the ministry if I accept the invitation that's been sent to me? But not only must we carefully consider the invitation and we have to ask the question, is the invite worth the sacrifice? We've also got to understand this. Be careful of pressure invitations. Be careful of pressure invitations. What do you mean, Jones? Be careful of the pressure invitations. Sometimes our invitations can come with pressure. Yes, the invitation comes with pressure. Be careful of the pressure invitation. When you look at what happens in the text, and if you look at verses four through nine, you can begin to see that as Nehemiah, continues to work as Nehemiah refuses to come down. As Nehemiah says, I'm not going to stop the work. I'm going to stay engaged in the work. It says that the enemy has sent an open letter. Yes, it says the enemy has sent an open letter. He's put pressure on Nehemiah. And then four times they come over and over again. Four times they've come and Nehemiah has responded the same way. And then the last time they sent another invitation, but they sent it this time in an open letter. The open letter is intended to bring pressure. The open letter is intended to get Nehemiah to be pressured into coming to meet with them. Nehemiah understands that if I stop the work and go meet with you, it, it hinders what's happening. It hinders the work that's going on. And Nehemiah also understands that now you're just simply trying to pressure me into coming to meet with you. 
the open letter is a problem because the open letter is just that, an open letter. They normally sent letters during that time by putting a seal on it. And that seal would not be broken until it received or was received by the recipient. And once the recipient got the letter, he would then break the seal. But Sanballat, Tobiah, and Geshem have sent an open letter. Anyone can read the letter. And in fact, that was their intent, that everyone who could lay eyes on the letter would read the letter. And within the letter, it was a slander and a smear campaign. It said that Nehemiah was trying to take over, that Nehemiah was trying to become the king, that Nehemiah had hired prophets to promote him, and that Nehemiah was simply trying to become the next powerful figure within Jerusalem. They were slandering Nehemiah's name. The letter was sent openly so that others would read it and look at Nehemiah and say that Nehemiah has an ulterior motive for building the wall. Imagine if that's you and accusations are being made against you. Yes, they're saying that the only reason that you are doing what you're doing is because you just want to be in charge. You want to be in control. You're trying to build a power base so that you can take over. And you know that it is an absolute falsehood. You know that it's an absolute lie to what they are saying. But yet the letter is circulating and it's saying that Nehemiah is intending to take over. But not only that, it goes on to say that, and Nehemiah, be careful because the king will hear about this. And if the king hears about this, you're in deep trouble. So it's best for you to come and meet with us. Nehemiah understands that this is all a setup. This is all intended to stop the work. This is all intended to get me to come down from the great work that God is doing in this community and that he's doing in the life of the people. Nehemiah says, I, I, I can't do that. And, and in fact, everything that you're saying is untrue. The stuff that you're trying to spread is untrue. And in, and in fact, they accuse Nehemiah of hiring pre prophets and priests in order to proclaim him. And in fact, that's what they've done. They've hired their own priests to, to come and, and try to persuade Nehemiah to come and meet with him, to come into the sanctuary to come. But Nehemiah understands that I can't do that. It's against the law for me to do that. And in fact, you're trying to get me to sin by breaking the law of God. Nehemiah is on to them and he's not falling for the setup. And because Nehemiah is not falling for the setup, they are angry. They are bitter about the situation. But what it shows me is this, the enemy is persistent. The fact that they kept coming at Nehemiah, four times they kept sending a letter to come and, and, and meet with us, come and meet with us, come and meet with us, come and meet with us. But Nehemiah refuses every time. And then the fifth time they try to apply pressure. You know, when the enemy can't get his way, he'll apply pressure to our lives. He'll apply pressure to our lives to try to get us to come down off the work that we're doing. He'll apply pressure in your family. He'll apply pressure on your job. He'll apply pressure in the grocery store. He'll apply pressure at the, at the car shop. He'll apply pressure in our lives to try to get us to stop the work of God. The enemy feels that if I can apply pressure to your life, you'll begin to turn down the work of God. It's the same thing that happened in the life of Job. The enemy felt if I can apply pressure to Job's life, Job would curse God and die. But Job stood under the pressure and we've got to do the same thing. Even though the enemy is persistent, we've got to be persistent too. We've got to stay the course. We've got to stand our ground. We've got to stand flat-footed in the word of God. We've got to stand flat-footed in our faith. We've got to stand flat-footed on the power of God and not come down from the work that God has us doing. And as we do that, we are determined that we are going to stay engaged in the work of the end of God. And as we stay engaged in the work of God, we will not come down from what God has us doing. 
because no matter how much pressure the enemy applies, I'm going to stay on the Lord's side. No matter how much pressure the enemy applies, I'm going to stay in the work of God. No matter how much pressure or where the pressure comes from, I'm determined to continue the work of the Lord. And when Nehemiah understood this, and as they tried to apply this pressure by threatening his reputation, Nehemiah says, that's not going to work. That's not going to cut it because I understand the setup. I understand what you're doing and you're not trying to do me any favors. And in fact, you're just simply trying to harm me because if I accept the invitation, it takes me away from the people. If I accept the invitation, it takes me away from the work of God. And if I accept the invitation, it will cause my harm. So I'm going to stay on the wall and I'm going to continue the work no matter how much pressure you apply. Don't let the pressure scare you. It's just an attack of the enemy. Don't let the pressure scare you. And in fact, Nehemiah goes on and it tells us in the end of our text, as we are looking at, it says that Nehemiah was even more determined. Hallelujah. And in fact, what they started out to do they just encourage Nehemiah the more. And in fact, when the enemy turns up the pressure in your life, be more determined to do the work of the Lord. When the enemy turns up the pressure in your life, be more determined that you're going to stay on the Lord's side. When the pressure begins to mount all around you, be even more determined that I'm going to st hold steadfast to the unchanging hand of Almighty God. And I'm not going to give up in this moment, but I'm going to keep holding on. I'm going to keep the faith and I'm going to keep moving forward by faith because I'm not going to let God, uh, let the enemy deter me from the work of God. I'm going to let God lead and guide me every step of the way. And as I let God lead and guide me every step of the way, I'm not going to let the enemy have a foothold in my life that began the pressure in the first place. I'm going to make sure that I keep my faith and trust in the Lord. God said he'd be on my side even until the end. And I'm going to trust in that. I'm going to believe in that. And even as I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, the Lord is with me. So I'm going to trust in that. And I'm going to believe in that. As God continues the work in me and through me, I'm going to stay engaged in the work. I'm not going to accept the invitations of the enemy. I'm going to carefully consider every invitation. I'm going to make sure that the invitation has to be worth the sacrifice. And I'm going to be so careful and very careful not to to let the pressure of the invitation get to me, but I'm just going to make sure that I continue to do the work of the Lord. And when I think about the invitations, yes, there's all types of invitations that may come. And I remember when Jesus Christ got an invitation from Satan and he got an invitation to engage in some things that would cause him to break the law of God. He got him engaged in him to turn bread, uh, rocks into bread. He got an invitation to throw himself off of the temple. But he says, I'm not going to do that. I'm not accepting the invitation. I I'm going to reject that invitation and I'm going to remain in the Lord's care. I'm going to reject that invitation and I'm going to keep trusting the Father. I'm going to reject the invitation and stick with the word of God. And as Jesus rejected the invitation from the enemy, the enemy had to leave him. But the Bible says he didn't stop. It said he just left him for a more opportune time. And yes, the enemy may keep coming back. He may keep being persistent in his attack against us. But you got to keep in mind, it's just a setup. He's just trying to set me up to get me away from the people of God. He's trying to set me up to get me away from the work of God. He's trying to set me up that he might cause me harm, harm to my life or harm to my reputation. But I'm going to stay on the wall. I'm not going to keep doing the work because I'm doing a great work. I'm doing kingdom work. And because I'm doing kingdom work, I'm going to stay on the Lord's side. And I'm going to keep working for the Lord. And in fact, it's going to make me even more determined to do the work of the Lord. But there's one invitation that you ought to accept every time. And that is the invitation to be in God's kingdom. Yes, God is sending invitations out all across this world to come and accept Jesus Christ 
as Lord and Savior, an invitation to come and believe in his son, Jesus Christ, an invitation to come and accept the fact that Christ has died uh, on Calvary for our sins, an invitation to come and accept Jesus Christ into our life as Lord and Savior, an invitation to allow God to work in our lives and to work through our lives that he might make us better, an invitation to give him glory and to give him praise, an invitation to allow Jesus Christ, the righteous one, Jesus Christ, the Holy one. Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God. Jesus Christ, the one that takes away the sins of the world. Allow him to come in and do the work that God wants to do in our lives. That's the only invitation you should accept without question. Because it comes from one who is holy. It comes from one who is righteous. It comes from one who has given the ultimate sacrifice of his son, Jesus Christ. And it comes from one who puts no pressure on you. He offers it freely, and he gives you a choice. Come and be a part of my kingdom. Come and be a part of God's family. He doesn't apply pressure to you. He doesn't twist your arm. He just asks you to simply accept the work of his son, Jesus Christ, and come and be a part of God's family. That's the invitation that you accept every time without fail. The invitation to salvation. The invitation to come and be a part of God's kingdom. Amen. I pray that that word was a blessing to you and now you understand what happens when the enemy tries to set us up. We have to consider the invitation. We have to make sure that the invitation is worth the sacrifice. And we also must be careful when the enemy tries to apply pressure to the invitation. There's an invitation that you can accept every time. The invitation of Jesus Christ. The invitation comes from one who is holy, righteous, and just. So you never have to worry about the one who sent the invitation. The invitation comes with a sacrifice. So you don't have to worry about what you have to sacrifice to accept this invitation. This invitation comes because of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And this invitation has no pressure. It's freely given to all who will. You can accept it or you can reject it. There's no pressure. But I encourage you to accept it. Accept the invitation of salvation. God is inviting us to be a part of his family. He's inviting us to be a part of his kingdom. So why don't you accept Jesus Christ today as your Lord and as your Savior? Pray with me. Gracious Father, we thank you. We thank you for the sacrifice of your son, Jesus Christ. I thank you, God, for the invitation to be a part of your kingdom. And I accept it now. I accept, oh God, the, the sacrifice of your son. I believe that he is your son. I believe that he died on the cross at Calvary. I believe that he paid my sin debt. And because of that, God, I accept the invitation to salvation now. And I pray, Father, that you would come into my life come in and fill me with the power and the presence of your Holy Spirit that you might use me for the work of your kingdom and I pray father that you would use me use me for the uplifting and the building of your kingdom use me for the work of the ministry and I pray father that by your Holy Spirit you would help me to be determined and to be equipped for the work and I thank you again for saving me now fill me O oh God with your Holy Spirit in Jesus name I pray amen if you prayed that prayer, why don't you drop us a line at wesleyonmain at yahoo.com. That's wesleyonmain at yahoo.com. And let us know you've accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. We want to connect with you. We want to pray with you and pray for you that God might lead and guide you on your new journey. So if you prayed that prayer, drop us a line at wesleyonmain at yahoo.com. And let us know that you've accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Or maybe you're looking for a church home. You can connect with us here at Wesley. We would love to have you as a part of our virtual community. We would love for you to be a part of this fellowship that God might bless us and bless you in the process. So why don't you consider being a part of this fellowship? Also drop us a line at WesleyOnMain at Yahoo.com to let us know that you want to be a part of the Wesley Amazon Church. Until next time, God bless.